It is great to see you guys this morning. I am so thankful for each of you and our poor sound guys. Every Sunday they have some catastrophe happen just for fun. I blame Dave. So I blame you, Dave, still. It's just your fault. It's good to see you guys this morning. So, you know, one of the things I was thinking about the praise team, and I was thinking all the people that are sick, including you, by the way, and and, uh, uh, I think of Denise, you know, she works in a wet market in uh, China, and it seems like she's always catching something. But, uh, um, you know, I was thinking about it. In the Old Testament, they would, and, and by the way, they did this in the Civil War, too. They would send the singers first. Did you know that? Civil War, too. Little 12-year-old kid. Hey, come on. It's time for battle. And the same is true spiritually. I don't know where you're at on your spiritual walk, but here's the truth. When you're at a point in your life where you're struggling with discouragement or something else, hey, Worship radio, spending time in prayer and singing the songs of praise will really help you to overcome. And it's like battle so often. And I don't know, I mean, there's a reason they call depression a battle. And often our emotions are a battle. And so I just want to encourage you, pray for the praise team. I'm so excited to see some young people up here um, and helping on Saturday night. One of our students who is uh, 14, I think, has started helping Saturday night. He's so excited. His dad texted me that he's excited about coming to church now. I go, that was just like me because I was pretty much bored unless I had something to do. Give the kids something to do. And here's the thing. 50 years from now, I'll be singing praise in heaven, but some of the students that are singing on stage will still be singing in church. So I just, I just love thinking about stuff like that and, and uh, pushing that along. And here's the other thing. I got to be at a church I was at 30 years ago, and hopefully none of them are going to watch what I'm about to say. And if you're watching, it's not you. It's everyone else. I was there 30 years ago. There were things in that church, like banners on there the wall, were that were church, there like 30 wall, years ago. And when I came in, one of the first things the wedding coordinator ago. said to I me is, in, you cannot the touch those banners. And I thought, what? 1974 is here still. So I got to thinking about just different things in life. And here's what I want to say to you as a congregation. And I really mean this. It is not a lie. Thank you for being flexible over the years. We've changed a lot of things. I mean, we, we move things around. We tweak things all the time. We've got guys in the back. I mean, Randy put this wood thing up here, which is awesome because you should have seen what was here before. And, and yeah, and the black ceiling, I remember when we started doing, I, I told uh, some people, I think we're going to uh, paint the ceiling black. And I had several people go, I don't think that's going to be good. And then we were done with it. Those same people came to me and said, that looks great. That's phenomenal. And Randy did all that work. And we've got so many guys who serve, people who washed windows and scrubbed the building and picked up the road yesterday. Just so many of you serve. And here's the thing. Not only do you serve... You serve and are flexible in it. We change things sometimes. We do different things. And most of you are like, fine with me, which is awesome for a church wanting to go forward. We can't do things like we did in 1973, 83, 93. This is going to freak you out. Even 2003 is 20 years ago. So um, I know, isn't that crazy? I suddenly, <laughs> and, but, but the truth for all of us and I want to encourage you just to continue to make the most important thing, doing what God has called you to do. So I was looking around my house. I finally found one of these. Do you know what this is? A cassette tape. This, you want to touch it? This is a cassette tape. By the way, not only did we do music on this, the first computers, you had to push play, record, and send your data to this and hope that it downloaded unless you would lose all the stuff you had programmed on your Tandy computer. Okay, I had a Tandy computer. This apparently has a sermon I did in 1987. We're going to hide it. So here's what I remember about tapes and why I brought it today. Uh, They had a show, and I'm going to see if I can play it and see if you can. (laughs) I love computers. Yeah, of course it's going to play an ad first. I had paused it, and it unpaused. All right, so we're going to see. Video will play after ad. 
Thanks for being flexible. All right, here we go. See if you know this song. It's really a bad version. Okay, so what song is that called? Mission Impossible. So today's sermon, we're going to talk about God's mission for us. And here's the thing. We're going to look at the disciples, but everything in the Bible has, and this is what I love, really, the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, has practical applications for life. And every once in a while, somebody will ask me about some obscure, horrible story in the Old Testament, and, and here's what I always say. So here's an answer for you. Like every once in a while, somebody will say, what about this thing that happened in the Old Testament? And here's what you say. You know, that's a non-example. Don't do that, would be my advice to you. Yeah, but what about so-and-so that did this to so-and-so? Yeah, yeah, don't do that. That would be my advice to you. So there are practical applications of Scripture, and today we're going to look at this whole idea of, uh, of, of a mission God's calls you. So what would happen to the cassette tape after they heard the mission? Do you remember? Self-destruct. This will self-destruct. By the way, in the really old days, I think they actually used records, which are back, I understand, and cool. So I'll still never be cool. So God has a mission for you. He's called us to follow him, make him first priority, and love others while we share the good news for them. So let's talk about that. Number one, Jesus calls us to follow him. And we're continuing in the book of Matthew and uh, Matthew chapter 4. Here we go. It goes like this, Matthew 4, 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, by the way, this is a summary of this story. If you want to kind of hear the backstory on this, there's some other places in the gospel that talk about the backstory, how this all happened. This is the summary of this story. As Jesus was walking on the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his and also called later the Rock, which before the Rock, there was Peter the Rock. Right, and his brother Andrew, they were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. I love that explanation there. For they were lazy. I mean, what else are you going to say after they were casting a net into the lake because they liked it? No, because they were fishermen. All right. And then Jesus says, "Come, follow me." Jesus said, "And I will send you out to fish for people." At once. They left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, and I love saying this name, James, the son of Zebedee. That's just a fun name. It's like zippity doo dah right? So James, the son of zebedee doo dah Here we go. And his brother, John, they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, I get to say it again, preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately left their boats and their father, and followed him. So uh, he gives us this summary, and later, though, you would see them fishing. And so we read this, and we think, how does this apply to me? Does, does that mean I need to quit my job? I'm hoping, Jesus, please, if I give my life to you, can I quit working? Can I just stop what I'm doing and just wander around aimlessly the rest of my life? Now, here's the good news and the bad news. Yes, the good news is you can do that. You will get very hungry at some point, but you can do that. But here's the really good news. Later, you will see all of these disciples. You ready for this? You ready for this? Fishing for fish. I mean, they fish for men too, but they fish for fish. So even though Jesus called them to leave everything, what was he doing? He was saying, follow me first. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to use what you already know how to do, but now you'll do it for me. So if you're a plumber, you can plumb for Jesus. If you're an office worker, you can office for Jesus. I don't know what you do at your office. You can have paper cuts for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the paper cut, right? If you're an electrician, you can get electrocuted for Jesus. Wait a second, I didn't say that one right, would you? That would only be if I was an electrician, right? By the way, if you're an electrician, you are the strongest person in the world because anybody who can stand all day like they're praising Jesus, right? Have you ever watched an electrician? This is an electrician all day long, all day long, hands above their heads. I don't know what they're, right, right? All the strongest long. people in the world. And in church, right. they should just do this. Strongest people just, in the world. This is the only time they, they put their hands they down. They're do like, this. I'm done. Do right? This is the only time they put their hands down. If you're mopping, mop for Jesus. If you're cleaning out the closet, clean out the closet for Jesus. 
By the way, here's what I've discovered. When I really do things for Christ, whatever it is, whether it's, <clears throat> hold your ears, whether it's the poopy diaper, Making a face right now, could be any minute, right? <laughs> Whether it's the poopy diaper, hey, can you change it for Jesus? Absolutely. Jesus called them to be fishers of men, but guess what? Later you see them fishing. You know why? It's because when he calls you on his mission, then everything you do becomes part of his mission. And everywhere you are becomes part of what he has called you to do. And so here's my question for you today. What will you give up to follow Christ? I thought it was interesting. I, I, I try to be careful about reading too, much, too many devotions on Sunday morning because I tend to preach whatever that person said in their devotion. But this morning there was a good story. He said, you know, when you go on a diet, the first thing you do, right, is you go in your cupboard and you see all those things that maybe you even just bought and you get them out of your house, right? Or you eat them all, one of the two. You got one of the two, right? So you get rid of the potato chips and you get rid of the chocolate and you get rid of all the favorite things that most of you brought today for our lunch. You know, all those things, right? You get rid of them, why? Because you're going to give up something to pursue a healthy lifestyle. Some of you have done that over the years. Some of you this year gave up soda. Oh, poor thing. Some of you this year have cut down on your intake of social media. Some of you this year have cut down on your intake of the news or maybe stop news altogether. Why? Because it was distracting you from the mission God had you on. So everything you do, you have to evaluate in the light of God's mission. Is there anything that you need to give up in order to follow Christ? Maybe you're dating somebody who's pulling you away from Christ. Maybe that's who you need to give up. Don't look at your spouse. That is not what I mean. Number two, first priority is what Jesus requires. So let me give you a really simple illustration. I heard it years ago, and I think it's such a great illustration. So imagine a married man comes home one day, goes to his wife, and he says, uh, Hey, uh, on, uh, <clears throat> on Monday nights, I'm, uh, I'm going to start a new uh, thing. Every Monday night, I'm going to play poker with the guys. His wife goes, Oh, okay, okay. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night uh, during football season and probably just the rest of the year even, we're going to have fantasy football night, so I won't be home. I'm going to be out at fantasy football. And then on, on Fridays, that's, uh, that's video game night. And uh, Saturday, um, just so you know, uh, I ran into one of my old girlfriends, and uh, we're going to start going out every Saturday. But don't worry, honey, I'm going to give you Sunday. How many think that's going to go well? How many in here are writing on a tombstone already, right? 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 <laughs> Told you I was sick, right? So, so here's the truth. We look at that, and if somebody said that to their spouse, we would be like, what are you, an idiot? And yet, people want to say, Jesus, I gave you Sunday. I, I gave you Sunday. What, what, do, what, do, what do you mean Monday? What, what do you mean Tuesday? By the way, when your wife says we need to talk, don't say, we just talked yesterday. <laughs> Have you seen these videos where all of a sudden it just flashes to a, a, a scene of somebody in a casket? That's the new, I've seen that on, on Facebook or the reels or whatever, where they, they show him saying something to his wife and the next thing you see he's in a casket. <laughs> Honey, I talked to you yesterday. Casket. How do I look in this dress? Casket. <laughs> exactly. So let's pick up in Matthew chapter 8, 14 to 22. I have a funny thought about this, by the way. Peter denies Christ later. And I've always said because he remembered this, but that's another story for another day. Here we go. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and when the fever left her, she got up and began to wait on him. So Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law right there. 
Which means that Peter was married, by the way. There's a church that teaches that Peter was never married and that Jesus didn't have brothers. You're going to struggle trying to get the scripture to say that. I'm just letting you know that's not true. And so he touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him, which is an awesome healing, right? When evening came, listen to this, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirit with the word And healed all the sick. This was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. What was Jesus doing? It was showing here. Matthew is showing us how powerful Jesus is. Okay? And then it continues. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Time out. So so think about what's happening here. Have you ever gone through a struggle and you say these words, I don't know why Jesus isn't just taking care of this right now? This is a scene where literally physically sick people are lining up for Jesus and they're watching Jesus touch somebody in front of them that was sick and now they're well. They watch a lame person walk away. They watch a leprous person all of a sudden healed, and they're in line, and Jesus, they're, they're five back, and they hear Jesus say to his disciples, hey, let's go. You, we, we skip this part of the Bible all the time, because the truth is, there's times where for whatever reason, we have to wait for our healing. We have to wait for God to do it. I I was fifth in line. I mean, there's, when we get to heaven, there's going to be somebody who was next in line. I mean, you think it was bad as a kid to wait in line for your favorite concert and all of a sudden they put that sign in the window? Sold out. No. Or your favorite ice cream. It's even worse. The guy in front of you at McDonald's orders a shake and then you pull up and they go, Machine's broken. There's going to be people who are waiting for healing and Jesus left. And then it says this. So he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. And then it says, a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Basically, I saw everything you did. Wherever you go, I'll follow. And listen to what Jesus says to him. Jesus doesn't say, oh, good. Jesus doesn't say, oh, that sounds great. Now, what does Jesus do? He tells him to count the cost. Listen to what he says. He says, Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, now listen to this, if you think the first answer was weird, listen to this one, said to him, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Wait a second now, what does this mean? Well, Several scholars have talked about this passage because it's a little bit confusing to us. Like, what? I shouldn't talk to my family anymore? That's not what he's saying. And many people think, (laughs) you ready for this? That his dad wasn't even sick yet. Like, let me, let me, you know, my dad, um, let me wait until he dies and then I'll bury him and then I'll follow you. When all the circumstances are right, I will follow you. And Jesus says, No, if you want to follow me, you need to follow me. Either follow me or don't follow me, but don't say, let me do this first. And here's the truth for all of us. There are always, always, let me say it one more time. Always excuses for not doing what God wants us to do. Always. Listen, I can make an excuse for anything. Listen, if you get in the car with me and we drive to McDonald's, And five minutes before, I told you I was on a diet and that I was going to eat a salad. And we'll pull into McDonald's and they'll have two for a nickel Big Macs. And a salad is $42, right? And I'll look at that menu and I'll go, you know, I want to be a good steward with what God's given me. I'm amazing. I can make an excuse for anything. And this is what Jesus is saying. What happens is people say, I want to follow Jesus, but only if you'll limit the pain and the struggle and the difficulty I have to deal with. See, one of the reasons we like sermons that just say, follow Jesus and all will be good. La, 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 la. Is because we wish that was true. Eternally, that's true. But Jesus even said in this world, 
you will have struggles. Well, I don't like struggles. God, I'll follow you, but could you just make everything go well? And Lord, could you kill that person that I really don't like? Isn't it amazing how we put demands on God? And that's what this is talking about. It's talking about, Jesus, I'll follow you, but please don't ask me to do that. Now, I will tell you something that I have learned. Is that if you really follow Him, is that if you really and surrender him, yourself to Him, and surrender then the very thing him, that you said, I'll do anything for Jesus but you that, said, when you actually surrender, He may even change your desires to where that's what you're willing to do or want to do. I know a friend who told Jesus, I'll do anything but be a missionary, and then he became a missionary. But he didn't become a missionary reluctantly. It's not like he woke up one day and said, well, I guess if I have to. No, he woke up one day and said, I feel a calling to missions. This is what I'm supposed to do, and he did it. And this is the thing about God. He changes, when you choose to follow Jesus, he changes your desires. He changes what you want to do. So disciples who all they knew was fishing, all of a sudden said, we'll follow you first. And then every once in a while, Jesus would say, go catch some fish. Put the net on the other side, guys. There's one scene where Jesus says, put, put out a little deeper. And the disciples say to him, we fished all night. What are you talking about? But then they said, but because you say so, we'll, cast, we'll do that. We'll throw down our nets. Are you willing to say, God, whatever you want me to do. My priority is you. I want you to be first. That's your next question. What keeps Christ from being first in your life? See, if you ever do construction at your house, there's certain things you know to do and not do. You don't do electrical work, work barefoot in a puddle. Right? That's kind of a pro I mean, as important as the electrical system is, you also go and hopefully turn, Randy, you go and turn off the breaker first. I remember years ago working for a plumber and when we were setting a toilet, he said, Eric, I'm going to teach you something that will save you $100. By the way, I think it's like $300 to set a toilet now. So he taught me how to set a toilet. And, and, and I broke the one here at church. Joe was there for that one. But, but, uh, but taught me how to set a toilet. And here's what he said. He said, you know what? One of the most important thing is don't over tighten the bolts. I said, what? He said, don't over tighten the bolts. I mean, don't just crank them down. He said, no, because if you do, you'll crack the toilet. You'll have to start all over and go get and pay for a new toilet. That's the most important thing. Jesus looks at us and looks at his disciples and say, am I really going to be first? And we like to say, yeah, but what about? Yeah, but what about? But yeah, but what about? Dwight Moody said this, the world does not understand theology or dogma, but it understands love and sympathy. So Jesus calls us to follow him. Is there anything we need to give up? First priority is what he requires and what, what keeps us from that. And then number three, love God and others while sharing. You ever expecting a phone call and you got your cell phone with you and you're nowhere near a charger and you're expecting an important phone call and you look down at your phone and the battery light is almost at the end. And your brain all of a sudden says, what can I do? I've got to answer this call. How can I conserve this battery? And you may be a person who's on your phone all day long. And all of a sudden, you're not. And you turn down the brightness. And you say, low battery setting. And you, you, hold, you would hold your phone like this if you thought it would help the battery, right? Right? You'll do whatever it takes. Why? Because you're expecting something important. So what are you going to do? You're going to look and say, what do I do to make this a priority? One of the reasons that many of us have not shared with a friend, or even, you ready for this, even invited a friend to church lately, which is a great first step for helping people find their way home. One of the reasons we haven't done that, it's not because they're not there, it's because we're not paying attention. We haven't noticed how important it is. Listen to what Jesus says next. And there's, there's two things in Scripture that are the most important thing. Here they are. This is the great commandment and then the great commission. Commandment, commission. It's easy. All right. So say commandment. Say commission. And some of you are like, where's my commission? All right, here we go. 
Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commands. Let me give you our church purpose statement. You've probably heard it before. It goes like this. At Surfside, we want to help people find their way home to Christ so they can grow in love with him and invite others home to Christ. If you can remember the idea that we want to be a church home, for what purpose? To help people find their way home to the real home, to Christ. And then as we grow, what? We learn how to show others who Jesus is. Why? Because as you love others, they part, start going, what's different about you? I've noticed something different in the last year. What is it? And that's when you go, I'm eating healthier now. Or you say, I've been letting God get first place in my life. Or I gave my life to Christ. Or I made a new commitment to Christ. And as you share that with people, sometimes you'll get this look. Uh, uh, okay. And other times you'll get this look. Really? And you say, you can come to church with me sometime. If you really love people, you're going to want them to have what you have. So you're going to want them to find their way home. Acts 1.8, Jesus said this. This is the great commission. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. So here's the next question. What, finally, what or who do you need to share his love with? It doesn't have to be complicated. I had a delivery from Home Depot this week. The guy came to my house way out in Chuliota. He said, man, this is out here. He said, I work out of Orlando. I said, really? He said, but I live in Coco. And I went, oh, <laughs> where in Coco do you live? Oh, round 520. <laughs> so I went and looked for a card. I was thinking, I gotta get a card. There's no card in my whole house, nowhere. So I got a church pin. And I said, listen. I see he was getting ready to go. I said, listen, this is our church. We're right on the corner of 524 and Cox Road. And if you have a question, I'm the pastor of this church. I know that's hard to believe. But I'm the pastor of this church. <laughs> They'll let anybody pastor at this place. You should see it. And, and, but I'm a pastor. If you need anything, you call. And my secretary will track me down. And I'll return your call. Anything you need. What was I doing? Just looking for an opportunity. Why? Because the guy said, I'm from Coco. I wanted to say, what are you doing so far from home? He's like, I drove an hour and a half already. I said, where's home? Coco. Coco. Right near your church. Oh, what a coincidence. You know what a coincidence is? Peter Lord used to say, coincidence is a miracle where God chooses to remain anonymous. God will put people in your path who need God's love. Pay attention. You can help them find their way home. Easter's two weeks away. Can you believe it? Easter's a great time to help people find their way home. Invite them to church. Hey, you want to do something radical? We're going to put more chairs out for the sunrise service. You ready for this? Come to the sunrise service, which is a simple, short service, and then go to lunch, breakfast with them, or brunch, or whatever they call it now. I'm sure C's will be open. Spend some time with them. Take, I know you never get up early on Sunday, but Easter... Get up early. You can get a good nap in later if you get up early enough. But, but bring it. And maybe they say, well, I don't want to come that early. Say, oh, good. 10 o'clock. <laughs> oh, well, I'm working Sunday. Oh, okay. Saturday night at 6. <laughs> Y'all got services all the time. What's wrong with you? But go out of your way to invite them. And then, listen, I'm telling you. Tell them you'll take them to lunch. Tell them you'll take them to breakfast. Tell them they can take you to breakfast. Whatever. Go out of your way to invite people. Why? Because people need to find their way home. It's your mission. So carry it out. Easter's one of the best times to carry that mission out. When they ask you, is your church perfect? Just laugh and laugh. When they ask about your pastor, go, you just don't want to know. <laughs> but let God use even that to help people find their way home. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian, to surrender your life to him, to say, Jesus, I know about you. I've heard about you. I know you died for my sin. I don't even understand all that, but I want to surrender my life to you knowing that I'm a sinner. 
That you died for my sin, so when I surrender to you, you take my sin and you give me your righteousness. I go from spending eternity in hell to spending eternity in heaven. Lord, it's not a fair exchange, but you do it. If you want to pray that today, if you want to come and talk to me about what it means to be a Christian, I'd love you to do that today. Don't hesitate. And if you're here today, and as I talked about inviting a friend, somebody came to your mind, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. And that's who you're supposed to invite. So go out of your way to invite them. Text them, call them. You can even knock on their door. Don't stay too long. But invite them to church. Invite them to know Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the mission that you've given each of us. Not just the pastor, not just people who are on staff at churches, but each of us has been called to help people find their way home. Lord, may we see hundreds and even thousands of our friends come home to you. And Lord, each of us lift up one of our friends, one of those that we've invited. And we pray, Lord, you'd soften their hearts that they might come home to you. In Jesus' name.